Hey everyone, so this video is going to focus on a very traditional Vietnamese dish that my mom has taught me called Chao Cat. And in this video I'm going to go through the process, but more importantly I'd like to make direct this video towards first timers. People who are spearfishing for the first time and foraging for the first time. Chao Cat is a simple recipe in terms of ingredients, but it does require some work. It just requires broken rice, garlic, shallots, ginger, green onions, and of course fish. We'll go over how to make a broth with the fish bones and carcass, and I'll show you how to remove the meat from the bones of the body. When we all start out, we're going to make mistakes, and sometimes we're going to shoot some fish smaller than what's expected. And as long as it's within the legal limit, there's no problem with that. I'm sure you'll still turn it into food nonetheless. But I think there's a lot to learn from shooting smaller fish, or at least fish that's considered okay. Um, I remember when I shot my first fish, it was with the three prong, and uh, it was a perch fish that was way too small, probably just about adulthood. And I split it in half, and the fishing partner I was with told me, Hey, great shot. This will make some good ceviche. He didn't say anything else. No, no bad comments about, oof, that was small, or anything. He knew it was my first time. When you're down there and you were wearing the mask for a first time and you're spearing stuff, especially if your mask is glass, things are going to look 33% bigger. And especially when you're shooting at a distance and you've never gauged anything before, you may end up with fish smaller than what you expected. And like I said before, it's okay. This is all a learning process, and as you continue to spear, you're going to get a better gauge of what sizes are, and big fish are in your future, especially if you put the time in. The fish pitcher that we're using for the soup is going to be a blue rockfish. Yeah, these are quite small for their size. They usually reach sexual maturity around 12 inches or so, the largest one in the pitcher being 10, and the smallest being 8. But hey, there's a lot of resource right here that I can use for my soup. Uh, working with the small fish actually uh, brought me back to my earlier days. Um, it made me realize all the small mistakes that I would make and get frustrated over. But then I realized I learned how to overcome them, and I really saw the growth when I was handling these small fish. For example, when you work with small fish, the bones are going to be more brittle, and so it's going to require a more gentle hand when you're going through the fillets. Uh, it does will require a more finesse, but... Um, help you become a better flayer in the future when you do cut your bigger fish. You're going to have those surgeon hands and you're going to really get into making cleaner cuts. Um, I don't want you guys to get frustrated when you try to fillet your fish and you get shavings or you don't get all the skin off the first time or you, it's not as clean. Um, don't worry about it. It's all going to go into the food. Uh, you've noticed that in my footage, I'm not doing clean fillets at all. I'm still making mistakes. I'm still learning. Every session is practice for me. And uh, I'm not sweating because I'm going to throw us all into the broth. And I, every part of this is going to be used. If you run into that issue where you don't get all this food off of the bones or there's still some meat or maybe you cut some shavings I dare you I want you to go back with your knife and I want you to try to get a really close cut do it again again and again I want you to see how close you can get with your blade I want you to really familiarize yourself with your blade how it bends how it carves the meat how it goes through the body the you're gonna master your blade and that's what's gonna happen like anything it takes time I've I've ruined so much fish uh, on this cooking process and I urge you to put the time in I want you to have fun when you're doing this this is a time for you to play around to really get to know your food to observe the stomach contents to feel the meat how it cooks to see how it changes and if you mess up all right there's always the nuclear plan for fish tacos and the more important thing is you're foraging man you are learning to forge for yourself, and that's pretty cool. So we just watched me take apart a fillet from a fish, and you saw me cut a piece of the fillet out. That's the rib cage where some of the bones are. 
I still have use for that thing, and I plan on taking the bones out and having a whole chunk of meat to myself. There's other parts that I'd like to tap into as well, such as the meat between the bones on the carcass, as well as the meat behind the head in the cheek area. In this scenario, I plan to use that meat to turn water into broth. The first step would be to take the carcasses and whatever part and wash them in the water. A lot of fish create some slime and also you want to get rid of the scales. You don't want any of that in your broth. Even after the wash bowl, when you put it into the pot, the first boil is mainly just to clean out the bones and clean out any marrow. Um, you're actually going to dump that water out and replace it with uh, your actual water, which you will count. The ratio I like to use is uh, Actually, in this, I'm still trying to get it down. In this video, I used through two thirds a cup of rice, and I used eight cups of water, and uh, the result was still rather uh, thick. If you're looking for a thinner broth, you can always go for a one eighth or a one tenth ratio. After a minute or so of rolling boil, I dumped all the contents out into a strainer and then refilled it with the beet and eight cups of clean water. As you can see, I added the green onion bulbs and my rib cage meat. The time to turn the water into broth. Dang, some of the meat that out now. Setting the heat to about a medium high, uh, I never really let it go to a simmer or even a boil. Um, I want things to slowly heat up, and you'll start to notice that there's a lot of foaming at the top too. It's gonna be the marrow and the, the gunk from the bones. What you can do to separate it and clarify your broth is to take a soup spoon or any round spoon really and just skim the top and take all of that foam off. It's tedious but well worth it. As your broth continues to heat up you'll start to notice more and more uh, foam at the top and uh, just keep up with it. If you feel like you're being overwhelmed with the foam just lower the heat and continue to keep picking at the top. So how do you know when you have your broth? Well that's up to you. You can leave the meat in there as long as you like and continue skimming, or you can call it after 20 minutes or 10 minutes like what I did. The longer you leave the fish in there and continue scooping the top, the stronger your broth will be, and the lighter it'll be when you remove it earlier. The foam will continue to produce as long as the meat is in there. After 20 minutes or so, I removed all the contents from the broth and put it onto a tray and let the broth settle. I'm going to go ahead and start picking out these parts and see how much meat I can salvage. I pulled the carcass out of the pile and put it back together. Immediately I saw that the meat fell off the bones and, more importantly, the meat inside the head was cooked. So it's good to know that's all in my broth. For the chunks, you're more than welcome to put it all in a pile that's uh, assorted away from the bones. But if you don't want to pick through bones and use that kind of meat, that's okay. You already used that kind of meat for the broth, so technically you used it already. But uh, I'm telling you right now, I am confident right now that there's no bones in my soup, and it's feeling good to see that meat pile grow. Now we're moving the bones from the ribcage meat, and as you can see, I'm not guessing or really working for where those bones are. I can clearly see them on the top. I run my finger along the top, or I see the node and just easily remove it. It's a lot easier than you think. Uh, and as you continue to hunt a certain species, you'll, you'll remember how many bones they have in their ribcage of that certain species. That way you can count and have full confidence that there's no bones in that uh, meat when you're done. At the end of this clip, you're going to see me reclaim a huge part of meat that is usually thrown out. So here is our meat pile. This is from the ribcage meat of the three rockfish as well as their carcasses. Uh, it doesn't matter that if it's in full pieces or not, it's going to kind of dissolve and break away and become part of the chowder. And then I still have the fillets I still need to work with, which is pretty cool. So I have a lot of fish. All right, let's go check on our broth. Should be pretty clear now everything's settled. It's pretty good. I've seen much clearer broths that my mom has made, but I'll take it. If you're finding that your broth is still kind of gunky or not as clear, what you can do is add some heat and the foam will reappear at the top and you can continue skimming until clarified. While we wait for our broth to reheat, it's time to work our fillets and cutting them into small chunks. And this is a fun part because you can practice your knife handling skills. You don't have to cut them into perfect squares and if you have weird fillets, that's A-OK. -okay. I'm just going to cut them into whatever angle I want. Uh, squares, triangles, as long as they're small chunks. 
And we're done. So we have our pile of fillets, a pile of ribcage meat and carcass meat, our broth, and we're ready to saute the fillets using just butter. So we're just going to do a high sear on all sides, add to a broth for it to cook fully through. While you're doing your sear, I want you to take a look at the bottom side and take note of the time. This is a good opportunity for you to see how a fish cooks all the way through and what it looks like when it's cooked all the way through. And some fish cook faster than others. After adding the meat, you're basically done at this point. You're setting the pot onto a medium and working on your garnishes like shallots, limes, or adding jiao wei, which is like a, a Chinese donut bread. I do hope you all enjoyed the video. Thank you for sticking through. I know it's a long one, but broth does take some time. Uh, I really enjoyed making the video and, of course, cooking as well. I think of you guys whenever I make my meals. I enjoy seeing your, all your progress, whether it's cooking or foraging out uh, in the sea. I hope to dive with you guys someday and see you soon. Jenga.